No, you know. There we go. Okay. Do you want it to your computer or to the cloud so she can get it? I'm, you know, basically I can do it to my computer and then I'll upload it to Google Drive so that she can okay. get it. Okay. You're up. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Tonight is February 21st. It's Mardi Gras. It's Tuesday night Bible study. It's Taco Tuesday. It's all of that. And we welcome you to our Black History celebration. And if it's okay, Sheila will be guiding us tonight. And I've, I've asked her to let me pray. Mother, Father, God, creator of this amazing universe that we live in, thank you for letting us join together to learn about each other, to know about who you are, to know your word, to know scripture, and most of all, to know how you dwell in all of us, the divine. We get to be introduced not just to the first people or to the famous people, but the people who are working behind the scenes for your glory, doing good in the world. And we welcome everyone to our table, our communion table and our wonderful table of learning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jackie, so much. So tonight we are learning about Ron Oden, who was the first you know, black gay mayor of um, Palm Springs. So I had done a whole bunch of research and then I found a perfect video that's about an hour and seven minutes. You know, we can listen to the whole thing or we can listen. If you have questions, you want to stop, we can do that and discuss. But I'm just going to jump into the video and let everybody experience this powerful man. I think he's a very, very powerful man. I have one question. Did you say like Palm Springs, like it's in Palm Springs, California? Palm Springs, California. Lily White, Palm Springs, California. Yes. Wow, amazing. All right, so here we go. Okay. Rod Odin here. He is a local, uh, just everything. That's what I like to call him. We're going to learn a little bit about, about him, his story. Um, and you can Google him. He's got a great story. We've been talking for about 20 minutes, and now we're going to really talk. My apologies for doing that to you, Rod. But thank you for being here. Again, we're going to start from the top. How you doing? I am doing great. I'm glad to be here. My allergies, sinuses, and allergies are bothering me, but, you know, if we can get past my nasal sound, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here. We can. I'm glad you said that. So, you are here. Why are you here? Why did you decide to come do this? I am here because of you. Uh, of course, I've watched you grow. I won't, I won't say grow up, but mature over yeah. the years, and... I'm so proud of you and the work that you're doing. So to participate in any way is an honor for me. Well, I'm honored that you're here. And I think that uh, earlier when we spoke, talking about kind of mentors and people that lead, I've always kind of been that. I don't know if you know that, but I've always looked up to you because of the, the path that you've paved and uh, you've done so much in your lifetime and uh, you do it so effortlessly and with a smile. How do you stay so positive and so happy? Well, I think part of it is my my spiritual base um, and my outlook on life. I come from a very spiritual family. And I say spiritual. Yes, they were Christians and they went to church, but they were more spiritual than they were uh, religious mm -hmm. and really sought to be at peace and harmony with themselves, with the fellow man, with nature mm -hmm. and with God. Wow. And that's uh, something that we don't hear a lot of lately, you know, especially with a lot of um, religions and, and then sects that are just kind of uh, extreme. Yeah. So you talked a bit about ministry yourself, right? Yeah. You're a minister. Yes, I have an undergraduate and graduate degree in theology, and I pastored for a number of years. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell us a bit about your background. I understand you're from Detroit. Give us, paint us a picture about your upbringing. Well, um, my parents moved to Detroit. Um, and at the time it was just my parents and the two kids, my older brother and I, mm -hmm. and my older brother and I would spend our, well, I'm a family roots. Both of my parents are from Alabama. Mm. And so my parents are from Alabama, my grandparents, my great grandparents, and my great, great 
grandparents wow. were all from Alabama, with the exception of my great grandparents on my mother's side, mm -hmm. uh, because my grandmother was raised by her grandparents who were Africans from the continent of Africa. So they were among the last Africans brought to this country. Let me ask you something. This is fascinating in its own. Are you able to follow this lineage? Do you know stories about your... This, see, this is something that Black folks really can't... Uh, really Man, I'm so fortunate. I am so fortunate. You are. Because my maternal grandfather was born in 1860. Your maternal grandfather? My maternal grandfather was born in 1860. Gee, wow. Did you ever meet him? <laughs> Yeah, you, See, this, we you were talking about... Oh, no. no, 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 this is the other one. Oh, got it. But he died in 1967. He lived to be 107? 107. Now, the thing is, that's, that's how old... Well, they tried to say that he was younger. Mm -hmm. um, but he would... And he, tells, he, he used to tell a story of what it was like when he was applying for um, some medical program and they refused to listen to him and tell when he told them how old he was. They didn't believe him. And they didn't believe him. And so the lady who was the oldest registered voter in the county said, yes, he is as old as he says he is. And she said, because when I came to the county, he was a young man preaching. Mm -hmm. And so she, she knew him. They still would not get give him the number of years that, that they said. They tried to say that it was 1863, uh, but he stuck with 1860. Mm -hmm. That's what he told me. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, he shared. So I'm second generation from slavery. Now, my grandfather was born during slavery. He was not a slave. He could have been. Mm -hmm. The only reason that he wasn't is because his grandfather owned the plantation. All right. But it didn't matter. He still could have been a slave. Yeah. Right. All right. He just got lucky. He just got lucky. Right. He just got lucky. And, and somebody was good to his father as far as slave ownership, et cetera. Yeah. Right. We, yeah. Okay. This is yeah. fascinating. Go and on. so, of course, he, you know, as a kid growing up, I just. I just, I was just fascinated. I just literally sit at his feet and ask questions. Mm -hmm. And to both of my grandfathers, and they were so patient, which was something that was difficult for my parents because, you know, they kept having more and more kids because it right. was, ended up being six of us. And trying to deal with me was more than enough. <laughs> and so, you know, they didn't have the patience uh -huh. to deal with. But my, I guess having raised so many children in both of them that, and they were older. They just took time. Yeah, and and they wanted. They knew what they were doing. They're, this is important stuff. Did they need, did they talk about the motherland? Did they talk about any any roots of Africa? Any stories? No, no. Um, I tried to get stories from my grandmother. Now, my grandmother has a very interesting story because she was raised by her grandparents who were Africans from the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, they had a daughter who was born in the United States. They were a couple, and it seems like they were a couple when they came to this country, and they still remain uh, together as a couple. But I could not find out any information about if they had other children in Africa before they came to the United States. But they had one child here. Her name was Charity. Charity worked in Mr. Shepherd's, it was the plantation owner, house. And when she was about 12 years old, he owned everything, so he took her as well. And my grandmother was born as a result of that liaison. Now, my grandmother uh, grew up on the plantation and played with the kids on the plantation who were her brothers and sisters, but she did not know that. And she tells tells the story, which has... This is what movies are made out of. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And she would tell the story of the fact of all the kids going to school 
and she was so excited. She was so excited to go to school. But whenever she would talk to her grandparents about going to school, they would never respond. But it didn't stop her. It didn't quench her thirst for education uh, or her zeal for going to school. And she said she and she would tell this story that would just send chills down my spine. And she said she remembers the day that the carriage pulled up to take the kids to school. And she said she was up so early and she kept telling her her asking her grandmother to comb her hair. And I mean, my grandmother had long, long hair. So it was but she had she was trying to do it herself. Mm -hmm. And she she said so when she heard the carriage pull up. She said she forgot all about the hair. She just ran out to the carriage and jumped in. And so she could hear the men talking outside of the carriage. And she said they kept saying, you know, nigga this and nigga that. And she didn't really know what, what was going on. And finally they came and told her she could not go to school, that, you know, niggas don't go to school. And she had never no, known a difference because they were treated equally. Uh, yeah. By, her, right. by, by, by the people on the plantation. Uh -huh. Even though she didn't sleep in the house with them, mm -hmm. she played with them, but that but there were no barriers in their play. And she, her the grandparents had to came came out and called her and she would not get out of the carriage. It took three men to pull her out of the carriage, a five year old girl. And she was the first Rosa Parks. So they told Maybe not her. The first, but think about it. Yeah, but not the first, I'm right, sure. Right, for sure. And they told her, well, one day we're going to leave the plantation and you'll be able to go to school. And she was a teenager before they left the plantation. And she said she remembers going to school. She had to have, she had to have, they had to have a white dress. So her grandmother, you know, made this dress for her. And she said she went to school and she said all the kids were seated. She was older. And she said the teacher called on the children and each one stood up one by one and they had to read from the book. She didn't know how to read. And so when the teacher called, you know, called on her, she just dropped the book, ran out of the classroom, went home, and never went back. She went to school for one day, but she prayed and she asked God to teach her how to read. And my grandma pick up her Bible and literally read and quote verses from Genesis to Revelation. And she could transact her own business, uh, banking, everything, learned to do all of that. Went to school for one day. But she said, she says, but that didn't fracture her. I mean, because I, I almost feel, I almost feel like from her experience when she was five, and then when she was, uh, that one day she said, spent school. That's enough to fracture somebody and scare them from not wanting to. Exactly. But it did the opposite of that. It did the opposite. Yeah. She said that it, that she made a decision that day. She said, none of her daughters would ever work in a white person's home. And all of her children would get an education. All of my aunts and uncles, including my mom, all finished high school, which for children at that time, people of that age, was exceptional. Yeah, it was like a college degree. It was like a college degree. Yeah. And none of her daughters ever worked in a white person's home. Well, she had that because of what happened to her brother. Yeah. You know? And uh, ironically, all of her father's children died before him. All of her, say that again. All of her father's children, her father, the, the, the man who's, who was her biological father, uh -huh. the, the plantation owner, uh -huh. all of his children preceded him in death. Gotcha. And on his deathbed, he wow. sent for her and she refused to go. She right. refused to go because he never acknowledged her in life. Right. So, you know, she saw no value in him, him acknowledging her in death. Now, and he maybe, was ready to acknowledge her on his deathbed. On his deathbed. Now, maybe that would have been he would have left her stuff, but... 
her ethics, her value system would not allow that to happen. And I admire her. How could you not? Yeah. That's all we have as individuals, right? Is our morals, morals and our the fundamentals of who we are. This, again, I hate to say the word movie, but this is, right? You agree? This is the stuff that movies are made of. Listen, believe me. There's there's so much more. I bet. There's so much more. Now, you say there's so much more. I can only imagine. I mean, spending time in Alabama, Detroit, uh, you know, you've lived a full life, so I'm sure. Tell me a, about the first time you experienced racism, if you can remember that. Yes, I can, vividly. Um, I was about five years old, living on my grandfather's farm in Alabama. Let me describe for you the setting, because we didn't have any electricity in the house and no indoor plumbing. We had a well on the back porch where we would draw our well and that the water that we would use to heat on the stove for bathing, for cooking, <laughs> and, and everything else that we needed to do, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, the house was lit by kerosene lamps. So I don't know if you've ever been camping and used a kerosene lamp, but if you have used a kerosene lamp indoors, it creates kind of a haze. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a smoky haze indoors. Mm -hmm. And that's all the lighting that we had in the house at night. And so it was beautiful yet eerie and you could then the smell of the kerosene as well. And uh, we sat down, we, we all sat down to eat. Me and my brother, my cousin Gwen, who was visiting, um, but her mother was a teacher further out, and so she would, she she stayed with my grandparents most of the time, and my grandparents. And the house was very orderly. My grandfather would, you know, everything would be set and ready at the table before he would come and sit down. When he sat down, then my grandmother would serve him. After he was served, then we could eat. Mm -hmm. And very orderly. Very orderly. Mm -hmm. And you didn't deviate from that. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather, you could, the things that he stood for, you could follow, you could set your clock to. Mm -hmm. um, and he usually never stopped eating once he started. And he, it was, he seemed pensive this evening. And I saw him put down his fork several times. He just kind of, like he was listening for something. And then he stood up and he said, everyone, get under the table. And me with my five-year-old active, hyperactive, and ADHD, I'm like, mm, what's going on? What's going on? And he goes to his room. And when he comes back, he's standing in this doorway with his rifle. Now, my grandfather hunts, but he never hunts. You know, he generally gets up early in the middle of the night and goes hunting. So we rarely ever see him with his rifle. And he says, don't. And so I'm talking, I'm talking. And my grandfather comes over to the table. He lifts up the table cloth and he looks me dead in my eye and says, don't say another word. So he never speaks to me that sternly. So I knew he meant business. But I'm five years old. And I'm hyperactive. So that almost went in one ear and out the other. And you wanted some answers. Uh, so I wanted, and I needed it. I yeah. turned to my brother and I'm like, what's what's going on? What's going on? So my cousin, who was younger than I, but spent much more time in Alabama than I did, she leans over to me and says, It's the Ku Klux, stupid. And I, I imagine my eyes just got just as big as saucers because I recently seen, you know, all of this advertisement and stuff of a movie about the 50 foot one. So I was imagining everything 50 foot, 50 foot. Mm -hmm. And I know that the only thing that I know that goes cluck is a chicken. chicken. <laughs> so in my five year old mind, I'm imagining this 50 foot chicken. It had to be 50 feet because my grandfather has his rifle for a chicken. Right. We never use a rifle for a chicken. You grab a chicken by his neck, flip of the wrist, blam, and he's gone. Uh -huh. 
got a rifle. So my grandfather goes out of the house and my cousin is, she's so close to my, my grandmother. So I pull over very close to my brother. Not, you know, he's just a few years older than me, but <laughs> that was my security blanket. And it seems like a very long time. It may have only been 10 or 15 minutes. And when we heard my grandfather's footsteps coming coming up the up to the porch, my grandmother climbed off from under the table and she ran to him. And she said, what happened? How many were there? What you see? He says, oh, it was about three or four of them. There was the Ku Klux. And I saw about a quarter of a mile up the road running to the truck. And... Of course, when my grandfather came back, I had so many questions, so many questions. Who are the Ku Klux? And that was the first time in my life that I understood that there were people who wanted to hurt me for something I had no control over, the color of my skin. But my grandfather taught me a very important lifelong lesson, and that is never be afraid of chickens. Wow, so that all, there's a metaphor now that all came full circle, more than a metaphor. You live by that. I live by that. In life, I've encountered so many challenges, some of them white, some of them circumstantial, but understanding that they're all chickens and that I don't alter my life to avoid them but I work through them. Mm -hmm. They're simply challenges and that I should not be afraid. And that's what my grandfather taught me. So I've, I've, I've learned to utilize those principles in so many ways. As a matter of fact, um, in 1998, 99, I was running for Congress. As a matter of fact, I was a Democratic running for Congress. Well, they go, Josh. <laughs> Um, I I said, Diego, yes. And of course, I went, I went for San Diego Prime. Yeah. And he waving to me. When I go someplace, where, wherever we've done, when we come back to council, we report our activities of the week. And so I gave a report and I said I was in San Diego and I told him where I went to. And while there, someone set off a, a, a tear gas canister and dispersed, dispersed blocks of people. I saw people running. <laughs> children, people with strollers and babies and dogs, just eyes burning. And it, it, it just took me back to that early experience that now people are being hurt for just being who they are. They're being targeted. And so, you know, whether it's because of color or whether it's because of sexual orientation, I, I told that story in, 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 um, in council and I said, I went to Pride not as an official representative of the city. I just went as a member of the LGBT community. And even though I never hid my life or anything, as a matter of fact, at the time I had a partner, and that was my big coming out story. It's in the papers, on the news, and now and, and everything they say about me since, the first thing they say is the openly gay, blah, 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 you know. Um, but the interesting thing is, they see this. People may never know my sexual orientation, mm -hmm. but they see black men. Mm -hmm. That's what I live with first and primarily. Mm -hmm. And even during the gay movement, I had to keep, because I worked with the leadership of Equality California, I had to constantly tell them, look, I understand that that's your priority, but it's not for people of color. Our priorities are different, and we can't set that aside. Is this what got you into politics? Talk about what, how you landed into politics. Well, kind of. Um, I had just gone through a divorce, and I was really kind of lost. Mm -hmm. Not kind of. I was lost after my divorce, trying to figure out who I am, what am I going to do, uh, and I had been a pastor before, but once you divorce, it was, it was very difficult to be to, to, to continue in ministry. And I had two children and trying to figure out how do I navigate all of these new things. And so my brother says, look, I'm tired of you being depressed. I'm getting you out of here. We're going to Palm Springs. 
What year was this? This was in, let me see. Oh. 88, 89, 89. So your first time to Palm Springs was in 89? No, I had been, been to Palm Springs, passed through it uh, before, but, you know, I didn't really know anything about, didn't know anyone here for sure, mm -hmm. and didn't know very much about the city other than everybody was old. And everybody was playing. Yeah. So I so I'm like, well, I'm already depressed. Why are you taking me to Palm Springs? <laughs> <laughs> we kind of laughed, but they had some nice clubs. And every day, all I could think of was Palm Springs. And I was getting excited about coming here. Didn't know why I couldn't explain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been a runner most of my adult life. And as we were pulling in, we passed the tramway gas station at that time, which is now our visitor center. At that time, it was painted pink and green and white. Oh, wow. Uh, just in complete disrepair. Mm -hmm. And that was the entrance into our city. But yet when I passed it, something spoke to me. And I told my brother, pull over, pull over. And I literally... <laughs> jumped out of the car and started running up the hill toward the mountain. And I'm, I know my brother was thinking, oh, no, he's exhausted. I'm too late. So he pulls over by where that liquor store is, mm -hmm. and he parks, and he starts walking up to where I am because I will get up to a certain point, and I stop. And as he's approaching me, he's using very colorful language. Uh-oh. <laughs> Do the math on that one. But he could, he could tell from my deportment that something – wasn't right. And he walks up, puts his hand on my shoulders and said, what's wrong? And I turned to him, tears streaming down my face. And I said, I'm home. I'm home. And I told him things that would happen in my life as a result of being in Paul Springs. And everything that I told him that day has come to pass. You gotta be kidding me. So for me, being there, look, this word in, in in the Greek, we get our word dynamite from the word dynamis, dunamis in Greek. Okay. But dunamis is written in the active indicative, which means that it's not an explosion, but it's in a constant state of explosion. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to me. How did I get started here? I moved here, did not know one person in this area. Went, got a job at College of the Desert, part-time, and a job at Betty Ford, part-time. And I worked those two part-time jobs for the longest. And four years later, I was elected to city council. In four short years of living here. Four, four short years, a black person in a city where I didn't know anyone and no one knew me. And a conservative city. At all oh, areas. believe me, it was a very different city when I when I started to get involved. People asked me to, uh, I was asked to sit on a, a Blue Ribbon Committee. And that Blue Ribbon Committee made a recommendation to the city to establish a commission and to write uh, an, an, an ordinance um, to establish the, the Human Rights Commission. I became the first chairman of that commission. Oh. And each year, but they, they established a commission but gave us no funding. Mm -hmm. And each year we would come back and ask for funding and they tell me no funding. I remember this particular year, the mayor at that time, um, and, I, and so when, he, when I raised my hand, he said, Ron, I know what you're going to say. We don't have any money. And I was like, wait a minute. Did this man just yell at me? <laughs> Did he just talk to me like I was his child? And I could just feel the rage building. And, I, and, and I, all I can think of, don't don't say anything, don't open your mouth. This is not the time. 
And so as I began to, my anger began to assuage, what can I do with this? Mm-hmm. It became very clear. I'm asking a policymaker to make a policy change. The only way to make a change from what I wanted was to become a policymaker. So I knew at that moment, okay, I'm going to have to run for council. Mm-hmm. And I did. The rest is history. Wow. I want to say, I'll go pause here for a quick sec. Does anybody have any questions? Are you guys enjoying this or? You're on mute. <laughs> this is amazing. I can't, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm dumbstruck, gobsmacked, whatever, whatever, whatever shock you could have. I had no idea who we would be learning about. And and I figured his, his words were better than mine. So oh, this, is, this is perfect. This is perfect. I hope that you'll send out the link. Um, Mama C came in. She forgot that it was Bible study night, but, um, I don't know if you all remember uh, Vivian Sims. Do you remember that that name? Anyway, she just was calling because she she learned that um, she's having uh, she had a serious diagnosis, has a cancer diagnosis, and oh, she no. was calling for prayer. And I said that we would lift her up in prayer, and that and that we were we were just having an incredible Bible study, just learning about people's amazing lives and. Um, I don't know how this person was picked. I didn't know that he was mayor, but I just think his telling his own story about growing up in Alabama and his family and this young man that's interviewing him, it just makes me hopeful, just so incredibly hopeful. And uh, for those of you that came a little bit late, um, he began his story talking about being a spiritual person. And he was a pastor at a church and he had to leave because he was um he got a divorce he got a divorce <laughs> and there was no room for him to follow his path and that but he said all of his family were in addition to being religious were very spiritual and that that was the source of his his faith and his his foundation so i i thought unsolicited that's how he began. And just the other thing that he said was how important, he was telling the story about how important education was in his family. And you know what, Sheila, remember when he said she went into the house and he could have her at will? Yeah. I've heard people say that and I never realized what that meant before. So I'm, I'm still in shock about that. And, at 12. Uh, at 12. Well, no, I mean, 12, that part doesn't shock me. But to to be in, quote unquote, the master's house in the master's bedroom, anything anything that the master wants, no one can stop it. You know, her father couldn't stop it. His mother couldn't stop it. At That whole idea, but to, you heard people say, have your way, have your will. So mm-hmm. I'm still a little stuck with that. And um, I read something this, um, I can't remember recently about how um, we had this notion that, you know, uh, black people that worked in the fields or worked in, um, who didn't work in the house had a harder time. And he said, in telling his story, imagine you were in the house and you were a sibling of people in the house and you, someone, you, you could be at that person's beck and call and not have any control and uh, look like your siblings. You know, this, this whole thing about being light skin and color and the color line. I mean, I'm in shock. I mean, if you, if we stop right now, I'd have to lay down. (laughs) Claire, do you have anything, any comment or anything? Oh, I came in a little late because I had a challenge getting on. My my internet was acting up and stuff wasn't stable, so I was frozen spot for a while. But I got part of his story, but I came in on the story where he was talking about 
the house with no electricity and the kerosene and right, right. Away, right away I identified with them because that was my early childhood environment too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very interesting how he went to place what I understood he went to the city where he didn't know anyone, but because of something his grandfather did, he was not afraid of chickens. I think that's what he was referring to. <laughs> obstacles and problems in life he called them all chicken that's exactly exactly it you know oh, basically okay. it, it, it was an unintentional metaphor at five years old <laughs> right right the 50 foot chicken i think that's where i think of my challenges now the 50 foot chicken <laughs> Don't exactly. Be <laughs> exactly. But, but no, I mean, I mean, the, the whole video was like an hour and seven minutes. And I know, you know, we have a hard stop, you know, um, at eight o'clock. But it was just, you know, I was telling Jackie um, before we started was that I had done all this research and had a, you know, slide pre PowerPoint slide presentation. And then I found this video today. Uh, and to me, I listened to it and I'm like going, I could not say anything better or give you guys a better feel of who this man was besides letting you listen to him talk about himself in his own words and listen to his story. I mean, he's got a wonderful testimony, a wonderful story. Right. Thank you so much. And it's different. That's one thing I like about our Bible studies that we are free to work within the environment of presenting things that we learn, whether we do it ourselves or through someone else. And I right. think that's a great idea being right. possible like that. I mean, even though we don't have time to listen to the rest of it, you know, which I'll send out the PowerPoint presentation oh. to everybody, which has the links. And I have another video that has a link in it. And he, he says, he said something that was quite profound um, you know, um, in regards to how he has, how a mother sees him, um, how he's going to affect, um, you know, her child. And let me see if I can actually, you know, do, do that. And one of the other things that, um, that actually I listened to was there was that even after he was a mayor, he would go out into Palm Springs and the rest surrounding cities, not dressed to the nines, but he had this old caddy that he loved to, he loved his old caddy and he would go, he would drive around. And you know, people, they, you know, they you know, basically they would follow him in the store as if he was a criminal. You know, you know, they, they profiled him as a black man who was gonna do something. And finally he had to go to the sheriff's department and say, this is who I am. I know what you're doing. You need to stop it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the mayor of freaking Palm Springs that they're uh -huh. doing this to. That's crazy. Uh huh. And that just shows you how, you know, nobody can get rid of racism. I mean, no, no, no matter what position you, you're at, you can't overcome, you never can overcome racism. Well, I think racism has its. Well, in the biblical days, there was racism or nationalism or whatever it was, where people want to be one one group of people want to feel superior to another group of people. Right. Yeah. You know, but it's just it's just amazing. And one of the things that I found really, and let me see if I can get this clip. Um, but Sheila, before you do the clip, you you've done. You've done so much work. Could you just let us like maybe just like in five minutes, just kind of go through your slides? Because I am I know that everybody's willing to click on more of what's on YouTube, but I I just really want to honor the time and energy that you <laughs> this together. And, and we still we still have like 15 minutes. So even right. in five minutes, if you could go over um, right. what yeah, you so selected and then tell us what to look at afterwards. I I, okay. I I just really want to encourage you and really thank you for this incredible presentation. All right. All right. So just, I did a slide, you know, so I, you know, his early life in, you know, in, in education, as he stated, born in Detroit, which really um, impressed me was the man is very, very, very educated. I mean, he has, you know, as you can see, bachelors of arts in history, science, theology, multiple master's degrees. 
Um, he also, you know, which he uses, he also, you know, um, theology, he also pursued, you know, courses in marriage and family and child counseling services, which he, he, you know, he, after he did it, he realized, I really don't want to pursue, you know, pursue that, but he must, he uses it in his everyday life and things like that. So, I mean, I just found that based on his history from his parents, his mother, he's very educated, very learned, and that was very, very important to him. Um, you know, him, you know, you know, as he said, he was a father, he's got two daughters and he's also a grandfather now. He's got two granddaughters and two grandsons. Um, and I really couldn't find any more information about them. I'm, I don't know whether they live near him in California, in Palm Springs, or whether they're, you know, other places in the country. But um, I thought, you know, as in saying for, you know, for that, that was, that's very, very um, impressive, I guess is the word that, you know, that, that I want to say. Um, and then looking into his early life in Palm Springs. You heard the story of how he got to Palm Springs, which I thought was quite entertaining, you know, which was, and truly that was my thought the first time I went to Palm Springs. It's Lily White. There is, you see no black people. And I was there like in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004 for golf tournaments for the Kraft Nabisco for the LPGA. And and then at that time he was the mayor. And that's the first thing that I looked when I got there was, you know, me and my best friend went, I'm black, she's white. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, what, well, am I the only black person in Palm Springs? <laughs> you know, and so, but the funny thing is, is that they do remember you. Cause I went for like two or three years in a row and the people that were the volunteers for the golf tournament, the second year I went, they're like, hey, you're back. Good to see you again. And I'm going, I was only here a year ago. I mean, do, do Black people resonate that much that you remember them? There's not that many that come into Bomb Springs. But, um, you know, so he, you know, he started with teaching um, and also working at the, you know, um, Betty Ford Center. You know, and that's how he got, and from that, that's how he got into politics because he got into, um, he got into um, a, involvement with the community. As he said, it was very, very important to him, and and so that's that kind of led him into politics, social issues, and so on and so forth. Which I, you know, which you know, it it makes sense. Um, I was I was really interested on on how he got from, you know. Um, being a professor to getting into politics and i think he explained that you know really well on the um um on the video um you know his political career um as he stated in 1995 he was he was he was elected to the, to the um the city council where he served for 8 years he got elected to, uh, as mayor in 2003 as the first you know openly gay african american mayor and i think that's Whenever you see his name, that's all you ever see right next to it. You know, first did, you know, he, first. did you find out whether did he come out in Palm Springs? Did he get gay before he was there? Or was he closeted and then later he I, doesn't really talk about that? He doesn't, but I think he came out. I think that's why he got his divorce. That was probably one of I think that's one of the reasons why he got his divorce. Um, of whether he actually was actually dating men and you know, um, you know, be, be you know during his marriage or not that I don't know but I think um you know that's why I got a divorce and shortly after that um you know I'm um, coming into Palm Springs I'm sure it opened up his life um and so you know so 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 politically you know he 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 became involved with various different things also you know with you know the NAACP and there was another article I found that had a whole list of all the various um, you know, compete, you know, um, you know, things that he had been involved in, you know, whether it was, you know, human rights, the NAACP, you know, you know, HRC, all those other things. And I mean, he was very, very, very active in the community, you know, in the gay community, black community for the, you know, for the whole. And um, one of the things, oops, I forgot to change the title. Um, one of the things that happened under his, you know, um, to Palm Springs while he was mayor, the, you know, this the city thrived. 
um, basically, you know, he made it a tourist destination for people like us, you know, so he definitely, you know, built up, you know, for, you know, the women, you know, African-Americans, you know, um, gay people. It became a very open city that just accepted everybody, um, which was, you know, which you could see that you know, in, you know, even when I was there in say 2003 and beyond where, you know, you've, you've heard about the Palm Springs white parties for both men, the other, like the men's white parties, the women's white parties and so on and so forth. And those were, those things were huge, you know, and, and, you know, um, back in the early 2000s um, and probably into the, you know, through probably 2012, whatever. But I mean, the city would just be flooded with gay women from all ages um and you know and gay men and there still is a black um women's lesbians community that's in palm springs that they do a uh, film festival every year in november which you know um i think i'm going to actually you know uh, go to one of these years so you know so basically for you know his life you know he, he really really um put palm springs on the map the city thrived financially you know economically and everything and so he was a very good mayor for palm springs um after that you know um he actually as you say you know um he ran for the Democratic, you know, primary seat in California and lost, unfortunately. And then also, he actually did try to run for second stint in 2015 um, for mayor again, but lost. And he ran again because he felt the city had lost their way, um, and he kind of wanted to get back to um, what he thought the city should be. Um, and you know, but but he lost that um, that race. And say for for different awards and say legacy, um, he's got a gold star on the Palm Spring Walk of Stars, which he got in two thousand and seven. Um, and also, he's been honored by you know different gay organizations. You know where he's got a, a lifetime achievement um, award, you know through um, Great Palm Springs Pride, and that and he got that in um, two thousand nineteen. And one of the things you know, you know he's you know he's a pioneer. He was an agent of change. He's been a mentor and he's actually paved the path for, you know, um, you know, for the black community, the LBGTQ plus community. And, um, and, you know, and that's, that's kind of what I found about him. Anyone have any questions? Any other questions? I, I have one question and, and maybe it's, maybe I'm just thinking out loud is that I, when he, talked about crying and feeling like he was at home, that Palm Springs, um, I mean, if you haven't been, you should visit, but it it was always a place that people felt like they could escape to. And so I wonder if even though he was black, you know, to become a whole person and to at least explore his sexuality, that was an ideal place for him, you know? and. And I'm wondering how much being there allowed him uh, to be his whole self, you know? I mean, I mean, the one thing that I don't know how gay Palm Springs was, Palm Springs was before he got there. Very gay, very gay. For it, was, it was very gay? Very, very, very gay. Palm Springs was where people would go to get away from Hollywood and L.A., and so they felt like they could be more, more okay. out there. The problem with Palm Springs is that it's hot. It's the desert. So right. people, people would disappear in the summer. It's if you've ever, no one goes there in the summer unless you live there. And also, um, you know, like famous actors, like um, people would come there uh, to. You know, like Bob Hope and all those, yeah, the Red like, Pack, you know, I know. Yeah, yeah, the Red Pack and all those, That there's a history of that, kind of like how we think of Las, Las Vegas now. Mm -hmm. And they have the gambling, well, they that, that had the mafia and all of that, but Palm Springs didn't have that. It just had the desert and it had 
I'm I'm interested that you said you went there for golf. Well, people went there for um, things around sexuality, things around golf, because it was out of the way. And, nobody... okay. <laughs> uh... and the mountains are beautiful. Oh, my God, they are. They're absolutely beautiful. I mean, because I think I saw one slide or one thing where he was saying that, you know, the makeup of, you know, the, you know, for the, for the, the demographics was, it was Palm Springs when he was running back then, I think it was like 3% black and maybe, I want to say, I think he said like 30% gay mm -hmm. at that time, you know, at that time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I mean, one of the questions that I had is that, you know, how a black gay man did actually, you know, become mayor of such a lily white place, even though you had 30%, you know, um, of gay population, you got 3% that's, you know, that's, that's a black, that's only 33% of possible vote. You still had a predominantly white, you know, uh, demographic that you had to appeal to, to actually get elected. Um, and I wonder, you know, and it's like on, did they just see him as a exception? I th look, the man is gorgeous. He's like ice cream and cake. He's <laughs> I mean, who? what's not to like? And he's charming and he'd been a pastor, you know, he's like super healthy. I, I think he was probably very charismatic, you know, probably more charismatic than a whole lot of people there. Right. And, and and maybe maybe for him, and again we can't speak for him. We could just speculate. Maybe for him was was a plus being black, a plus being gay, a plus being willing to be out, a plus. Um, I I saw that on your slide. You they said he was Seventh Day Adventist. Um, they're a very tight community too, but they would not have been accepting of him being gay. So mm -hmm. I, I just think that maybe it's like, you know, just the lineup of the stars, right place, right time, where he could be his whole self. And mm -hmm. oh, but that's a good question. Yeah. I know, I know we're getting close to the end, but I really I cannot thank you enough, Sheila. This is like amazing. I love your slides and um I will I will help um remind you to please send out your PowerPoint and the links. And this is something that, you know, not everybody can come, but everybody could watch this and learn more about him. And right. is he still alive? Yes, he's still alive. As well, yeah, he's still alive. Um and um he you know um he lives in, you know, he you know he still lives in Palm he lives in La Quinta, you know, which is a suburb of, of Palm Springs um in the desert. Um, he does have a LinkedIn profile. He's, you know, right. Yeah, I mean, I think he's in. He works in, you know, political arena and you know, um, that type of thing now. Um, but um, but I'm sure, you know, yeah, Dre, Dre and Amani are moving to Palm Springs. Um, we we have other MCC members that are out there. I mean, there are people that want to live there. So right. the other thing is for the purpose of the um the uh, recording can you mention the other thing you want the other link that you want people to be sure to look at and what is the link right what, well, what do you yeah. want us to take a look at yeah well, I, was, I was gonna say both of these videos are part of my um um presentation so you know the actual the you know the link is embedded in here so it will be in the um um presentation but and all well, you do is just, it's, it's, it's just click on it and and basically it was a you really let me see what's up. I think it was the, her. The best effect that you've had. And this was really cool. Is there any one thing that you really... What's not to like about him? Look at him. <laughs> effect as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after I was elected, I went to an event. And a woman came over to me and she gave me hugs. Yeah. And it's what I would call a familiar hug. Right. She hugged me like she knew me. And I didn't know her. And she grabbed by the hand. She just come here. Let me show you something. And she carries me across the room. And she points. She said, "You see that tall, good-looking young man over there?" And I said, "Yes." She said, "That's my son." Uh, she was white, and he was obviously um, a mixed kid. And she said, "And my son is gay, but he doesn't know it yet." 
Oh, 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 oh. Uh, he's going to face some issues. He'll wonder whether or not uh, he can accomplish all of his goals that he has set. And I'll be able to say to him, you can do it because Ron Oden. That's right. And of course, I mean, you know, first of all, how astute she was as a mother, you know, and, and she's preparing herself to be able to address whatever issues that may arise with her son, which I think is just truly exceptional. And, you know, it was certainly something that I never thought about because for me, I was elected, you know, I've been elected in the city for eight years. And yeah. I decided to so, I, so I thought that was really cool that, you know, that, you know, people can use him as inspiration. That's beautiful. Beautiful. I'm all warm and fuzzy. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank I'm... you so much. Thank you. So you are so welcome. Josh, are you there? <laughs> he hasn't said a peep. Are you good? Are you okay, Josh? I... He's muted. <laughs> I was going to say, take yourself off of mute, Josh. We just wanted to say hi and make sure your knee was okay. We see you. <laughs> yeah, I took the scissors out today. Oh, good. Good. Well, let's close in prayer. We love you with the love of our God of our understanding. Thank you for inspiring us today with not people who were first and famous, but people who just are whole people their whole lives and they were shaped by wonderful, wonderful things. Yeah. I want to pray for everyone who is in need of prayer. Mm -hmm. Just needs to know this is a good time to have hope and mm -hmm. peace beyond all of our understanding. And we will see you next week. And thank you so much, Sheila. This was amazing. You could do like video production. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. You're, you're like you're like you're making Bible study. Like, oh my God, she's embedded, and and, and it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. that Dale, Dale will be very proud of us. So, oh, yes, <laughs> do well. Thank you for recording, and I'm I'm ready to go, to go back to Palm Springs again. It makes me want to go visit and find Me that. too. Definitely. I definitely want to go back to Palm Springs. And I think I do want to go back for the jazz festival, I think, which is in November. Well, the, film, the film festival is amazing. If you haven't gone to that, the women who organize that are like they're just delicious and wonderful. And they would love yes. to have you come. Okay. Yes, they are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you guys, everybody. Thanks, guys. You guys have a good night. Yes, you too. Oh, I wanted to tell you, Angela Davis is on TV at eight o'clock on um, Finding My Roots. So if you can find her on oh, your okay. TV, I mean, it's just an amazing story. Okay, much awesome. Like, much, much like the one he just told. I mean, okay. it's incredible. Okay, okay awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.